Hello everyone, um, thank you for joining us on a Sunday morning. Um, I was too early for my queue, yesterday I was too late for it, so today I'm delighted, so that's great. Um, so today we're joined by the author and illustrator of the amazing book Superheroes. This book spotlights more than 50 British icons and who are doing amazing things in their fields and they are presented as modern day superheroes because they do such amazing things in their fields. Um, and so we are joined by Sophia Takur and Denzel Dankwa, who are the author and illustrator of Superheroes. Let's give them a warm welcome. Hello. I'm not certain that's us. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's, I'm not Cat White. So <laughs> um, okay, we can pretend to be them today. Um, so there will be time at the end to ask any questions. So think of any questions you might have and we'll come around with a roving mic. Um, so first of all, hello. Thank you for joining us. Um, I just want to know, first of all, how the book came about and what those initial conversations with Murky w were like. And Sophia, maybe from you. Um, I remember it was the bleak winter of lockdown one. <laughs> yeah. So really, they could have turned around and said, we want you to write about a frog. I would have been like, yep, anything <laughs> at this point. But um, they said they've got this idea where they want to turn a bunch of icons, like British icons, into superheroes. It gives them origin stories, give them powers. Would you be up for it? I said, yep. Absolutely. Um, that's how I got involved with it. But Denzel's story is far more interesting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so for me, um, I reached out to Murky Books when I finished my first year at university. So that was in like 2019. And then like it wasn't until months later where they reached out to me and I found out that, you know, someone suggested me for this project. So, mm. yeah, that's how I joined it. I was oh, like nice. in early 2020, though. So, yeah. So when you reached out, what? What did that email look like? How did you present yourself? Um, so it's literally like a DM on Instagram. Like <laughs> I sent to them because I followed the page for a while. So yeah. I just sent them a message saying that I'm I'm 19 and an aspiring illustrator, and like if you have anything, or I'll be happy to just draw anything for you guys. So that's really yeah. bold and really paid off. Yeah. Um, and so what was that collaboration between the two of you like? Um, I enjoyed it to be fair because like just sharing ideas with people was something that you know I thought was really cool and the fact that they gave us the freedom to you know present these heroes how we wanted was a mm. cool thing as well. Mm. Was there kind of a, a process or a brief that you set for Denzel or was it just a case of you just feel free to draw however you want to? I think it was the latter um, yeah. I feel like we I think there were probably times when you animated before I wrote and then times what I wrote before he animated. Um, so I think that kind of bounced off quite nicely, but I was just completely impressed by the animation, so I, I had no anything to say. Yeah. It's like, wow. Um, and so with that animation process, Denzel, um, so what a lot of people won't know is you're colorblind. Yeah. I just learned this today. So Denzel's actually colorblind, and um, he's still... he's able to illustrate and animate so beautifully. Um, how does that kind of tie into your work and what does that process look like for you and what does it mean for you I know colorblind is different yeah. across the board so what does that mean for you um so for me with my colorblind list it's, it's kind of like red green colorblind but it applies to other colors as well because there was a time where I painted the ocean like purple and stuff like <laughs> that so I used my laptop and it's got like a software that labels the colors and so like I know what certain things are supposed to be like I know the sky is blue and stuff like that so if I pick this color it say it's blue and like that's how I started illustrating this stuff so mm. yeah amazing um so what for you with your um illustrations and for you just with the the copy for each person what were you trying to put across with each um story with each superhero what was your aim really in, with the book I think it was someone said something really interesting the other day and I kind of stole it as my reason <laughs> for, the, for the, my method to writing. And she basically said when she read some of the profiles, she realised that these people weren't necessarily one in a million. They weren't necessarily anomalies. They're just people who had a passion and had the bravery and the boldness to just pursue it and work really, really hard. 
And obviously when we think superheroes, we think like Batman born into mm-hmm. it, Spider-Man born into it, or like bitten into it. Um, but these people just worked really, really hard. So I think for kids, it's just such an important message that actually your passion can entirely and completely make way for your dream if you really want mm-hmm. it to. Because um, it kind of it kind of normalises your dream as well, which mm-hmm. is quite nice. So in the profiles, I definitely try to bring in their family, their upbringing, play around with their origin story as much as possible as mm-hmm. well, um, bringing in things that they've said in interviews. So like uh, Dina Asher-Smith, fastest woman in Britain, she said that her fear is a massive part of her power on the starting line is something that really kind of triggers her to just snap into action so her superpower ended up being when she passes when her foot passes like the mouth of her spikes a current shoots up through her and then it meets her fear in her belly but then when it is fighting and intertwining it creates super speed Mm -hmm. and that's what makes her like the fastest woman in britain so it's just really fun it was a really fun (laughs) really fun writing process um, I love that because it creates this sense of um, that anyone can be a superhero as long as they have that passion, as long as they have um, the drive to work for it, which I think comes across really well. Um, with your illustrations, what uh, I notice a lot of them are quite do borrow from that superhero kind of theme. Mm. What were you trying to get across with those? Um, so, like, my influence is mainly comic books and things like that. So I was just trying to you know, combine my love for that and highlight e- each people's, just like, to highlight their abilities and what makes them special and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. something like Afrocentrics, you know, they, they own a hair brand and presenting their, you know, their skills and their, their hair as a superpower is something that, you know, I thought was cool as well. Mm. Um, so what did the selection process for this book look like? Because there are so many amazing people doing amazing things. It must have been really difficult to narrow it down into one book. Um, how were you selecting people? What different industries were you choosing from? And who? how did you decide who would make the book and who wouldn't? Denzel and I didn't have that much say <laughs> in who made the book. Um, it was between mostly Murky and the Murky team and the Stormzy team. Um, but I think what they did definitely try to do is get people in loads of different industries. So you have... In the entertainment section, we have people like Mo the Comedian or Michael Dapper, George the Poet. But then we also have weather forecasters, we have news presenters, we have scientists, there's models, there's activists, there's people that work in the youth um, empowerment space, there's NHS workers. Um, So it does definitely go across the spectrum. So I think what they, and we've got chefs, I think what they wanted to do was just people that were top of their game in loads of different spaces, um, which which is great because I think oftentimes you... Not that it's a bad thing, but as a kid, you think, like, footballer yeah. or, I don't know, I'm trying to think of what girls generally want to be growing up, but it's left me. But I think just having this broader area spectrum, it allows your interest mm. to then develop into a potential career as well when you see it in front of you. Mm. So I think that, I'm guessing, that's what they were going yeah. for. Um, and have any of the people in the book reached out to you or ha- given you any feedback and what has that been like who's it been if anyone yeah some people it's been really lovely because you're fans of them once you've kind of done the research and realized just what kind of person they are so um temi fagvalane who's a WNBA player she reached out um we, she actually used to train me when i was like 10 11 years old oh, did she remember she that america yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so it's really really nice um, so she reached out, um, a model called Ikram, who was one of the first hijabi models. Um, she reached out, um, Kosa Ali, who was in the film mm-hmm. Rocks. Um, she reached out, which was amazing, because I was such a big fan of Samaya as a character in Rocks. Um, Omari McQueen, Princess Kay. Emmanuel Loney as well. Yeah, mm-hmm. she was on the news talking about it, which mm-hmm. is cool. I think that's most of them, to be honest. Yeah. yeah, must be so nice getting that feedback and knowing that it's reached whoever's in there and they feel kind of proud for that um have you had any feedback from the young people in your lives any cousins siblings just anyone young who's read it and felt inspired by it at all I was saying um in the green room that there's this like two week gap once you release a book where no one's had time to read the whole thing yet so you're kind of just assuming (laughs) Assuming it's going really, really well, you're just doing all the promo yourself, um, trying to convince everyone it's great. But I'm hoping within the next like few weeks we'll get an idea of what like the younger cousins or the younger nephews think. 
but I think just as a concept, people are quite excited about it, which which is great. So I'm just hoping that the writing kind of matches <laughs> the enthusiasm. Yeah. Um, so this book is mainly, it can be enjoyed by older audiences, but it's mainly aimed at young people. Um, did you have, or do you kind of wish you had a similar book to look at when you were younger? And what does it mean for you to be able to have young people pick up this book and be inspired by it? I, yeah, I definitely um, wish I had a book like this when I was younger. I think one of the big reasons I wanted to take the project was just because of its potential. You know, the book itself isn't political. It's a fun book. It's a really fun read for kids. But its impact has so much potential to be revolutionary because what if we look at the spectrum of the curriculum and you look at where you see like black faces or Asian faces, oftentimes it's only in the slavery section of a history book. Mm. And where I'm in and out of schools, I see who and what kids become on the other side of a history lesson. I see how it changes the playground. Um, because when you read something as a child, all you can take from it is either your imagination or fact. Mm. And if the only thing you see is someone like you, but from a position of weakness, it does something to your imagination. And if the only time as a non-black person you see black people in the curriculum is from a position of weakness, it can plant that first seed that then the rest of the world can continue to water as you grow up and it becomes dangerous as well. So for me, I think, one, protecting young kids' imaginations was really important. So I think a book like this allows you to do that. And the second thing, I know we, we use representation as a buzzword, but I think it's just balancing the spectrum of where you do see blackness and then broadening the spectrum of what we call success mm. to include incredible black people that have done amazing things mm. um so yeah like i said the book's not political but i think its impact will be really great i was um talking to my mum's sister the other day and she's in a, like a predominantly white area and some of the things that the kids say to my younger cousin it's just kids can be mean right kids can be so kind of raw and mean but I always say they're such a perfect case study for what's actually happening in the world because they have no filter mm. um so I think a book like this can just hopefully balance the perspective and just reintroduce ideas of lesser or equal or more in a more balanced and fairer way I think yeah um it's a good point being made about um, black and Asian kids kind of seeing themselves in, like you said, positions of influence, positions of power in a sense, but also for white children to see kind of to, to learn as well what, you know, black and Asian people are doing. And like you said, it's a great reflection of the world and what they know and what they learn. Um, so I'd love to know who, for both of you, some of your favorite superheroes were growing up and you could take that in a very literal Batman, Spider-Man sense, <laughs> or you can take that in uh, people that you looked up to personally. Um, I think, for me, speaking like fictional-wise, uh, I like like a lot of superheroes like Spider-Man, X-Men, things like that, because, you know, growing up in schools, like Spider-Man's just that kind of superhero he kind of struggled with, balancing school life and then, you know, being a superhero. But not only that, he was a intelligent guy that enjoyed going to school and things like that mm. so that's what that's what i liked about the spider-man thing so yeah mm. did you have any non-fictional superheroes um i would say obviously my parents because to come from where they come from provide opportunities for like me and my sisters mm. and stuff like that i think you know it's something that i look up to yeah mm. great Steve. i think i really liked dash from the incredibles <laughs> I, I used to run once upon a time, like you guys, <laughs> don't run anymore, but um, yeah, I just thought he was cool, I had a crush on him, he was like the cool kid in school as well, and he was just so fast, and in fact it stretched, because I remember being in my second year of university, and there was a period of time where I would watch The Incredibles, mm -hmm. maybe once every two weeks, instead of working, <laughs> instead of going to lectures and seminars, that's what I was doing, um, so definitely Dash from... Uh, the Incredibles but then like Denzel um my mum my parents I think you realize how much your parents do is you then when you become a working adult and to think that they work all day and then they come home to us 
and cook and clean and, and just carry on. When I come back from a work day, I don't want to talk to anyone for like three to five days. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just seeing how much they've been able to do um, and build from scratch in a land that they didn't, they hardly spoke the language when they came. You know, I'm this close to useless when I go to a foreign country <laughs> and I don't speak the language, let alone trying to build a family and a home and to get to the positions they're in now. I think it, it's, they can't be anything but superheroes. Yeah. Um, and who are some of your current personal favourite superheroes? Again, can be fictional, can be non-fictional. Um, for me, I feel like I'll be guessing a bit much, but um, there's an illustrator called Dapo Adiola. He works in like children's books and things like that, and he's been mentoring me recently. And like seeing what he does and the effect he's had on the children's publishing industry is like something that you know, I aspire to be like mm. as well. So he's helped me a lot. So, mm. yeah. Still my mama. <laughs> Definitely still my mum. But also, um, I was watching, is it One not WandaVision mm. on Amazon Prime? And her, for the first maybe like six episodes, I think she was great. Really? I think it got a bit weird. It got a bit weird. But <laughs> a bit weird <laughs> yeah. afterwards, yeah. But her, WandaVision's cool. I think she really means well and she puts yeah. her family before everything. She's just a bit misunderstood in it, but I just really feel like I relate to her. And um, Black Lightning, because I think he does the same thing. He puts his family and his people first um, before everything sometimes. Mm. I think it's probably them. So just going back to the book, um, so you mentioned that it was sort of conjured up at the beginning of the first lockdown. Um, and so how long did it actually take to sort of come to life and... What was that process like? What were some challenges that you faced in the writing of? And what were some high points for you both? Um, so, yeah, it started in lockdown one and then the world just crashed. So we had like a year break and then we came back to it. Um, but when we came back to it, it was quite quick. It was a really, really quick turnover because we had they had a release date in mind. So we had... I want to say maybe two months or three months or something to just get it over the line. Um, but the interesting thing is about writing about people that actually exist and not fake superheroes is you need their approvals. Mm. So there's maybe 57 people in the book. Mm. So bless um, Tallulah from the Murky team because she was one who was liaising with all of the agents, all of the, whether they're weather presenters and it's their agents or literature people and it's their agents or actors and it's their mm. agents. It was a complete nightmare for that kind of two weeks because everyone's either got something they want to add in or um, something they want to take away because all we had was Google, I guess, and some things on yeah. Google aren't accurate. So yeah. if I'm writing someone's story and I'm saying, oh, this this happened here, sometimes it was something they didn't want to talk about anymore, but okay. you don't really know unless you know. So it was things like that. But then also um, <laughs> what we found quite interesting, we were joking about it the other day, is that some when you read a profile of yourself and you kind of remove your thinking from superheroes you kind of want it you kind of read it as a bio mm. so I remember we got an edit from f from one of the people in the book um and the edit was basically he turned it into like a bio like a wikipedia page essentially and there were no superpowers and no anything mm. and the agent was like we don't want any superpowers or anything inside it and we were kind of like it's a kid's what, book. What was the reason? Why? I, d I don't, I don't know. I think there was just some kind of discord in the, in communication. But once it was kind of explained and everyone went back and explained it, they were like, oh, okay, like it makes, it makes sense. But I think when you read a bio of yourself, you kind of also want to include, in like 2008, I, my book got optioned for a film deal, but for kids don't care. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Kids, kids just want to know what happens mm. when you shoot your hand out. So <laughs> it was, it was definitely striking that balance, but once um all of that was done it's it's been such a dream to work on i'm um i'm a poet first and foremost so mm. i i deal a lot with like the the real life like tangible emotions so to just take my mind away from that and go into this dreamscape of mm. a world was just such a fun project to work on especially in lockdown when the real world was yeah. just who wants to be there yeah <laughs> it's it's really interesting um with what you're saying about agents and the people having some input how much input can they reasonably be given? Because I'm I'm assuming that at some point you've got to be like, we need to write it in this style. Like you said, there's no like superpower in this. Is there a point where you say, okay, we can't have you in it if we can't have this kind of approach to it? What, was there any real difficulties or? 
I mean, if I had it my way, <laughs> if I had it my way, there would be a very fine line. But um, I mean, at the end of the day, you're writing about them and you want them to enjoy mm. their read as well. You want them to see it and read it and think, oh, wow, this is really fun. I'd love to. It's a cool thing to be turned into a superhero, mm. you know, like as a, a, most of them are maybe between like 20 and 50, um, except Princess Ken and Mari, who are really young. But they've grown up on superheroes. To, so to think that their nephews or nieces or kids are going to then learn them mm. as a superhero. You want them to have that feeling. You want them to read it and think, this is such a moment. So I think it is, it's probably 70% wanting them to love it and it being being an enjoyable read for kids as well. Um, but then obviously that 30% is kind of, there's a style in the book. There's a style to, to what I write and how I write. Um, and it also, if there's too much input from random things, there's just going to be discord throughout the whole tale. So there was definitely moments where we just kind of had to draw the line. But I think it was only one or two because everyone was just such, everyone was, it was a blessing that everyone was such a dream to work with. Um, but yeah, it would, it would be luck of the draw if everyone was <laughs> yeah. a dream. But it was, it was a really peaceful process. Yeah. Um, did you have any challenges, Denzel? Uh, I had quite a bit, I think. Not in regards to like working on the project but I was in my final year of university mm. whilst I was working on this so I was doing dissertation and then I was doing assignments and things like that so some days I'd like wake up do my online lecture and then start working on this project and stuff so mm. it, it was it was hard to like balance both of it but I'm, I made it to the end so yeah. I can yeah. imagine and what was that window of, t of time for that deadline so you're you're told okay we can start this up again from there until deadline how much time were you given? I want to say like two, three months. Mm. I think I don't know. Yeah, it's mine's slightly different, but uh, it was. I think it'll be around that time. Yeah, it's kind of hard to remember now, but yeah, yeah it, was, it was quite quick because it was a new list as well. Yeah, I yeah. think there was like twenty-eight or nine new people added yeah. when we yeah. came back to it in a short space of time, which which was okay. Like the profiles aren't significantly long, but it's just balancing everything else you're doing at a random time in the year to mm -hmm. kind of slot it in, but. It was such a beautiful project and writing, like I said, writing it's fun and the Murky team and the Penguin team were just a dream to get this over the line mm -hmm. as well. Everyone wanted it as much as everyone else, so that really helped. Yeah, and so what was the editing process like with Murky um, and how much freedom and input were you able to have in the forming of that project? Um, the editing, you know, <laughs> I don't think there's a writer that, massively enjoys getting their first round of edits back because mm -hmm. you go through the first few from the editor and you're like oh okay yeah, I can understand why you would suggest I should do that I'll take that in or I'll remove this word here or I'll change the sentence but once you get like 60 pages in you just think do you hate do you hate me <laughs> do you hate what I wrote um but to be fair for a book like this it was so 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 helpful to get extra eyes because you create these powers in your head and you you've you've talked through the whole origin story in your head and you're hoping that it prints in a way that a child can read mm. so when you're trying to bring in like magic cylinders that are activated by a certain temperature in the weather or whatever it might be in your head it's, it's a working superpower <laughs> but then when someone reads it and they're like mm, you're kind of like you didn't get that from, from, yeah. from what I said and then you read it and it's kind of like of course you didn't get that from what I said so I think having extra eyes um in this kind of space is paramount to it making sense otherwise you're just it's lockdown as well you're you're so inside your head and yourself um so the editing process was super super helpful but even that being said it was still a very slight editing process mm -hmm. um, there wasn't any significant change the power um changes which was good yeah did you have any i'm not sure how it all works but did you have any kind of young people as focus groups did anyone anyone young sort of look at it and give their feedback or is that just not what happens i feel like if we had more time yeah. <laughs> it would have happened but it yeah it didn't it didn't i was just hoping hope, writing and hoping that a kid would relate to it but yeah. um like i said in a few weeks hopefully we'll know yeah. <laughs> i mean for me like while i was working on the illustrations i've got two younger sisters so yeah i kept on asking them like what they thought of it and things like that especially like checking if the colours are right as well. So yeah. <laughs> yeah so. Is this green or blue? Yeah. Um, so is going back to like the theme of superheroes, why is it that or why is it important for young people to have superheroes or people to look up to and what kind of 
you mentioned before that a lot of the time, especially within kind of ethnic minority communities, that there aren't many positive examples being put out into the forefront. Um, and so beyond things like musicians, footballers, etc., why is it important to see a broad landscape of what a superhero can look like? Mm. It's a really good question. I think um, even though we're calling them superheroes, I think having a book like this, it humanises your potential. Mm. And w- w- what I mean by that is, if you look at the curriculum, or even just, um, my mum and I were saying it the other day, I don't know if anyone read The Colour Purple mm. in school, but it's a really sad book to, to give kids to read. It was like The Colour Purple and um, the other one with Lenny and... Of mice, of mice and, and men. men. Of mice and yeah. <laughs> um, but the curriculum hasn't changed massively, you know, since my mum first came to London all the way till now, and there's copious amounts of new literature. But if you look at how black people are portrayed throughout the curriculum, or even just ethnic minorities in general, there's a real dehumanisation of them. Um, even when we're taught the transatlantic slave trade, we're not taught from a critical perspective. Mm-hmm. We're not taught from a point of when this was wrong to enslave people. Let's encourage empathy in our children. We're taught this is what happened. Here we have Great Britain. You know, so I'm not saying it was from a point of celebration, but it definitely wasn't from a place Mm -hmm. of remorse or regret. And what that stands to do is dehumanise the subjects in that story because you don't learn about the people that were enslaved as people you should now empathise with. Mm -hmm. You learn about them as stepping stones to Great Britain or stepping stones to the Great West. Um, so I think, and, and and if you look at some of the bigger problems we still have in society when it comes to race or, or gender or whatever it might be, a lot of it is because of dehumanising, you know, for, for someone to um, shoot a kid point blank because of they were scared for whatever reason, it's because they've been dehumanised in their head. Mm-hmm for people to create such vicious headlines about a black person doing the same thing a white person's doing, but if we have like a Raheem Sterling situation, mm. um, but the black one is just, it's painted in such a horrible way, it's because they've been dehumanised in that writer's head, and that seed starts somewhere, and we're, we're most impressionable whilst we're young, so I think if at the most impressionable, susceptible, sponge stage of a kid's development, we can humanise each other, we can humanise women we can humanise black people, we can humanise disabled people, we can humanise people around us. We stand to just create a more empathetic generation and a generation that looks at each other as equals instead of lesser than or more than. But if the only thing you take in as a as a young student is black people were once slaves, Africa has flies, you, you go into the world thinking that, you know. Um, I've I, A lot of people in our area that we live in are like Jewish or Indian and um i the conversations that i have with some of my older neighbors i still see how far from the reality of black people they they are mm-hmm. you know to the point where they're still calling them colored or they're still shocked when they see black people doing successful things because they're in an echo chamber of only seeing negative black press um so i think just creating that balance at the earliest stage i like i said i think it's a revolutionary thing to do i think mm-hmm. Um, so in your opinion, where do those changes need to begin? Is that in the schools? Is that in media? Is that in households? Like where where can we begin to start making sure that these black Asian superheroes are being seen and being taught about? I would say definitely start in the schools. I'm not saying that I think the oldest generation in London is too far gone, but I know what it's like trying to talk to my nan yeah. sometimes yeah. about things. And <laughs> um, I think we have we have fresh meat, <laughs> and I think we should work with them. Um, it's harder to change an adult's opinion, right? I think we, we grow up and we, we step into our biases, we step into our thoughts, so that's unlearning. But I think if whilst they're doing the learning, we can just kind of weave in information that's a side that I really really care about because you're not immediately coming up with defense so that's not just teachers that's parents that's older people that are in any kind of leadership um I would say they're my favorite that's my favorite space to try and have an impact in because there's just there's less tension no one's trying to argue with you for saying equality should happen Mm. you know yeah I suppose it also helps if you know white parents are giving their own children books like this so that they're sort of learning outside of their own cultures and you know not being afraid to look outside of your immediate and bring that into the household um so I think the timing of your book actually coming out it being kind of post 
Black Lives Matter protests post George Floyd, where I think a lot of different industries were sort of waking up to different ways that black people do face discrimination. Um, how did that kind of, did those events affect anything about the writing of this book? Do you think it kind of changed the tone in any way or do you think it just was a, a case of great timing and everything was just where it needed to be? I think it definitely informed the writing process. You know, everything was going on and suddenly you have to write about a book about black people. Mm. Was there like <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely, it intensified everything, but also it, it was this constant reminder of how important it was. Um, obviously, it's, it's always important whether there was protest or not, but just seeing the world around you burn because of race, it, it for me anyway, especially just lockdown generally was quite morbid, but it gave me something to it inspired hope mm -hmm. in me mm -hmm. whilst I was writing these stories I thought actually although we're going through adversity now they a lot of these people in the book have been through adversity and look at how they've come out mm -hmm. so when you're writing the story of hope you're powerless but to have faith that actually mm -hmm. the world's burning right now but after that there'll be very fertile soil to just grow again mm -hmm. and I think that's what it is this year this it's a lot more companies were panicking last year and we were seeing really funny things come out of companies mm. by way of making a statement but I think now the dust is settled and people are more aware of what position they do want to take or what they do need to take or what they don't want to take ultimately um the th what's coming out is a lot richer mm. you know like when things burn they or break they have a chance to open and you see inside and then you choose how you want it to grow again so this book was a choice of black celebration and not mm. black mourning, for example, mm. which I think in essence of balance is essential. Mm. Um, you made a good point earlier about um, being in schools and reading books like The Colour Purple. And I remember reading that and like To Kill a Mockingbird, which was the only other kind of black themed um, books that I read. Were there any books for both of you growing up that you enjoyed as a case of like black celebration was there anything that you read that you were like okay this makes me feel positive um for me like it's kind of hard to remember but i remember my parents they always had like these kind of african folklore books mm -hmm. for me to read and stuff like that but and especially like tales like the nancy the spider and things like mm -hmm. that because yeah it's like that's what they had me reading at an early age to you know see myself and then know that you know that we're in the book industry and stuff like that so mm. yeah i don't fully remember i think likewise we definitely had like african short stories and stuff at home but i don't remember i remember a john agard poem but i don't know if it's positive um half cast mm. and we used to watch this video of him performing it and it'd be like half cast something 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 half cast but again i, I just from the name, I'm guessing it wasn't a positive poem, but um, <laughs> I don't I don't remember much positive uh, black literature growing up. But also that being said, I don't think I desired it that much mm. growing up. I think my parents were aware of how necessary it was. But as a child, I don't know. M children now are a lot smarter because they have more access to information. But I don't remember thinking, looking at my curriculum, thinking, oh, my gosh, this is so white. People are racist. You mm. just kind of took it for what it was. Mm. But then you grow up and realise what those seeds can turn into. And then in hindsight, you think, actually, we, we could have diversified here. Mm. That's an interesting point. Do you feel, because, again, when you are younger, you're not always conscious of what's being fed to you and how that's affecting you would you say what can you describe any kind of ways that you think always being immersed in almost like white canon and or negative depictions of black people in literature um can you kind of describe any ways that you think that did affect you growing up i think um as we grow older, we learn the context that it exists in. So you learn new words and terms for what you once just felt the impact of. Mm. So it will be things like, um, let's say you're going into school and your mum's cooked you traditional foods to bring into your lunchbox. And kids generally are quite mean, but once a child also believes that Africa has no money and they're poor and they eat flies and whatever else, any food you then bring in becomes attached to that context. Mm. So the teasing that used to happen in school when especially um, kids whose parents may have just come from predominantly West Africa, the teasing was mean. Like the teasing was really, really, really mean. Um, 
And it's things that, the sad thing is, it's things that you once had pride in as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you leave the house thinking, I love this food, I love these clothes, I have no problem with my parents' accent. And then you go into school and all of these things are are the butt of a joke. Mm -hmm. And you learn your perception of self based off other people's opinions of you. And then we grow up and we call it imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think we didn't have the words for it then, but we definitely do now, but we felt the impact of it. Even things like... um, if we think about hair, right, hair's, hair's massively political because it, it tells your story. Um, and growing up, relaxing our hair was the norm, like it was a normal thing to do. If you had an afro or if it rained and your hair would go frizzy, we're terrified of that. Mm. When really, your hair's just reacting yeah, to the rain, water. you know, it's just yeah. water, exactly. But this idea of it, it becoming out of place because that's what we would consider it out of place when really it's just reaching its form mm. um that was a really bad thing for us we would use relaxer we would break our hair by the age of like 15 16 um and because we didn't have any positive representation of natural hair at the mm. time but i think now kids growing up they there's more discourse around hair there's more encouragement around um afro hair or various hairstyles and that could also mean if you also like relaxed hair or straight hair by all means my hair's straight right now you know mm. um but I think now it's a choice, whereas b- there was a period of time where it felt like an obligation, mm-hmm. and that ain't right. <laughs> so I think, yeah, I think you feel the impacts as a kid, but you don't necessarily always relate it to racism or um, discrimination, but you do definitely wear the impact of it until you unlearn it again as an yeah. adult. Yeah. Do you have anything to add, Enzo? Um, in regards to, like, representation in books, I do remember, like, reading an article in uni referring to, like, how only 5% of books were, you know, like, had black main characters mm-hmm. and things like that. And also how, you know, main characters eight times more likely to be an animal than mm-hmm. an actual eth- a person from an ethnic background. So reading, reading things like that made me realise how, you know, how much more work there is to do in the children's publishing. And I think Murky Books are, like, doing a great thing to have this book out and show that, you know, there's people like you out there doing great things. So mm. yeah, I think it's important. Yeah. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on, because I know that a lot of uh, superheroes, um, especially when they are of colour, um, face a lot of backlash or are kind of scrutinised a bit more than maybe their white counterparts. People like Marcus Rashford come to mind straight away. Um, how do you think... How, d- in terms of superheroes being in the public space and that pressure and that backlash and criticism they always face, how do you think that affects or doesn't affect younger people watching that unfold in the media? I mean, if I was a young boy that liked playing football and I saw how Marcus Rashford got treated. I don't know if I'd want to be a professional football. You know, you can represent England and, and do the works and really, really try your best. But the what happens to him or like to Saka and, mm-hmm. and Raheem Sterling afterwards and the people around them, it's not just them, it's the, the death threats people around them suddenly start getting because they missed a penalty. Mm-hmm. It's not even like life or death. Um, so I think... For me, I'm sensitive, so I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd bow out really, really early. But um, I think it can definitely be... I think, one, it can be demotivating, but I think also having to know that you're going to pursue your passion against the grain, mm. it's just a bit long. Like, you know, you want to be able to pursue your passion just happy and excited as a kid would go into something they love doing you don't want to think okay I really 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 want to be a journalist but I need to make sure my hair's like this my dress is like this I speak like this my background's like this there's of course there's professionalism but if you're trying to be professional by pulling away from your blackness because your blackness is considered unprofessional or it it opens you up to a space of being deemed um exploitable by the media for example it's just not a fair deal, you know, for for something you enjoy doing. But then that being said, um, there's a hustle in everything as well. And I think when you do go against the grain, you have to really ask yourself how much you want it. And I think that forces you to work that much harder as well. When you create the experts, you create the world class players, artists, um, writers. Um, but it would just be nice to just exist, just just, just exist, <laughs> you know, not not fight to exist. Yeah. And do you have anything to add? Um, it's kind of like, this isn't like, um, real superheroes, but I remember the, you know, the time where I was like 11 years old when they revealed that, 
you know, there's going to be a black spine man and seeing how the backlash that had alone, like how everyone didn't want to see, um, you know, a black spine man, just something simple as that. It kind of it can have like a negative effect on how you want to, you know, perceive going into comic books and things like that. Mm-hmm. You know, I, d- I didn't really pay that much mind to it though, but yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier that you had an illustrator that you really looked up to. Um, in your respective fields, um, are there people who you would say paved the way for you to really push for what you are now? Um, I'd, yeah, I'd say, like, for me, it's, it's, it's Dapper again, because, like, when I was re- when I came across his work, I was literally typed in black illustrators and there was only like a few so mm. obviously his work stuck out and um to to just even be talking to him was like a really cool experience because like, he's doing books that you know celebrate black kids you know being intelligent and he's got a book called look up that has like an intelligent black girl that wants to go into space and things mm. like that which is a good book for young readers to have i think mm-hmm. yeah like quite Denzel, i think we're in a really cool time where there's a lot of black people doing really cool stuff in our spaces. I say a lot. A lot is an overstatement. A lot in consideration to the to the none. <laughs> um, but um, I know in poetry, there's um, or just literature as a whole. Like there's Candice, for example. There's the Queenie writer who's also in the book. Mm-hmm. We have Renee Edo Lodge. Um, so we, there are definitely people paving the way for um, black people in literature. What I would really, really love to see is not the removal of black from the subject matter, Mm. but I would love to see black writers get the same opportunity as white writers for writing about something that isn't black centered, Mm. for writing about love or loss. There's there's a poem by, I think it's a Palestinian writer, and they're basically saying, um, we don't get to write about flowers or the Mm. moon because our world is burning. Basically, we don't see flowers, we don't see the moon. Um, And I think, as as much as that can be the case for black people, I also think we also experience joy. Mm. We experience romance, we experience family, we experience dreamscapes, we experience all of these things that other uh, everyone in the world does. But sometimes the only things that are picked up by publishing or picked up by mm. film is when it's focused on like black trauma or the black existence or black in London, black in a hijab, black Muslim, black, do you know what I mean? Mm. And I think it will be not, again in, in an effort to humanize the black existence to be able to know that if I do just want to write a romance book, publishers will jump at it the same way they might jump at someone else's. Mm. Um, so then that would be amazing to see. But then that being said, in the past few years I've been in publishing, the the, the change and the growth and the the opportunities that are opening right now, it just feels like such an amazing time to be part of an industry that is trying to listen. Are we always getting it right? No, no one is. Mm-hmm. But I, but there, there's definitely an effort, and I think there's an interest now as well, and I think we definitely are moving into the space of let's talk about more things, um, which is, yeah, which is, which is really a beautiful time. And we're not that far off from when black people couldn't vote, you know? We're not mm-hmm. that far off from when black and white people couldn't be in the same shop you know so as much as in our heads we think bro equality simple let's just get there just do the right thing it's not hard mm. we're not that far from when it was really really bad and considered right so i mm. think it is still a journey and we are still in the infancy stage of the journey but god willing by the time our grandkids are reading their own superheroes books it's a very different conversation mm. yeah um, I wanted to open up to the audience, so if anyone does have any questions, we can send a mic around. Yeah, just here. Um, so just wait for the mic. And Very interesting conversation. Thank you. Uh, I'm Ram. Uh, I'm from BAME, uh, Black and Minority Ethnic Community. My question is, what were the inspiration for you to write uh, My Heroes? Oh, me. I wrote it. (laughs) 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 Good question. Um, I think um, to introduce a new world of comic as well, because I think when we think comic books, we think like the Spider-Mans, the Batmans, people that don't actually exist. (laughs) But to turn people that do into superheroes, um, not only is it interesting and it's fun as a read, it's fun to think, oh, um, Michael Dapper, but as with a cape, or Mo the comedian, but 
his his power is pulling laughter from people's bellies. Um, it's just a re- it was a really fun take on stories that we would otherwise just read as like a bio. Um, so I think for me that's why I I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Anyone else? Just at the front here. Um, hi, thanks so much. Um, I'm Kai. I just wanted to ask, um, for you as a poet, how was it for you like changing stylistically to then write this book? Did you write with your normal style or was it very different? Um, that's a really good question. I remember the first draft of one of the um, <laughs> superheroes that I wrote about and I thought, I'm, I think this rhymes accidentally. <laughs> and I don't think it sold what I was meant to be selling either, but I was reading a book um, called Of Blood and Bone at the time, which is basically like... Harry Potter, Hunger Games, mixed together, set in Nigeria in a magical world. So because I was reading that, I was kind of in this mind state of, okay, keep it animated, keep it mystic. Um, But I definitely did have to will myself back because I'm also... So, for example, one of the um, women we write about in the book, Cece Phillips, she's a painter and she she creates these absolutely stunning, colourful murals. Um, but, But her aim and her reason for painting the way she does is because she wants to add colour back into the black. Um, she, she just wants to remove the idea of black as grayscale or black as sad. So she she draws in bright pinks and bright oranges, really, really stunning pieces. And to me, as a concept, my natural thing to do is turn that into a poem, adding colour into a situation. Beautiful. It's exactly what you want to write about as a poet. Um, so I think for some of them, I did have poetic licence because the same way poetry plays around with feelings and turns like a feeling into an image or a thought into a person or a place into a concept, so does the book. So I think that they're not massively far apart. I think if I was writing biographies, maybe it would be a bit more difficult, but I definitely did have to just like, I had to tone it down and then tone it up because there's also a melancholy when you're writing poetry. But with kids, it's all smash, bang, wallop, shoots, electricity, currents the whole thing and I'm literally the most thing mellow person when it comes to writing so I did, I just had to wake up basically to answer your question you had to wake up <laughs> and yeah just Hi, I'm Ram again <laughs> uh, I'm quite uh, pleased with the passion that you're demonstrating uh, and with reference to that I have a question on feedback you know, uh, when somebody gives feedback, it is very difficult to first take it in. Then to implement it is even difficult. So when you said that editors were giving you the feedback, what was your feeling at that time? I mean, at first I was like, yeah, I see what you mean. <laughs> I see what you mean by that great point. A really, really great note. In fact, I was even replying to the comments on the document, like really, really good point. But like I said, halfway through, you're just kind of like, but I, I meant what I said. <laughs> I meant exactly what I wrote and I meant it how I wrote it. Um, but it's also remembering that you've been inside your head with the book and other people are going to read it. Do you know what I mean? I didn't write it for me to read it again and understand because that's great, but it's not, this is not the point of it. Um, so I think in editing for anyone, it is a humbling moment where you have to think, um, you need extra eyes because these are the ones that are going to be reading the book. These are the ones that are going to be generating their opinion and you want them to get it. You know, you want them to understand it. And sometimes it's really easy to forget as an artist. I think it was um, Kanye who did an interview, not to bring up the Kanye interview, but he did an interview not too long ago. No, a while back actually. And someone basically asked him, do you care that people don't understand the music you're making anymore? And he was like, no. I don't care anymore. Like, this is, this is my art. And I think we really miss something there. <laughs> I think we really miss something there when we we stop caring about how people take in what you're making. Because if you want it to be powerful and you want people to be impacted by it, you can't be the only one who understands it, you know? So at first, don't get me wrong, it's a process. It is like a constant remembering other people are going to read it. They don't hate you. They're just doing their job. They're just doing their job. They're just doing their job. Um but it's we all have the same big picture in mind, which is let's make this a powerful book. So I think when you keep that in mind, you can just humble yourself enough to just get the job done, I think. Um, I think you had a question down here in the second row. Um, 
my name is Trey and um, what do you think schools should do to combat learning about black history? Um, for me, I think maybe focusing less on the negative sides of black history and focusing on more people that have like had a positive impact on the way we live today instead of the usual slavery and things like that. Th you know, that's that's what my personal opinion though. So yeah. yeah. And and I would say teach it with remorse as well. Um I think we we some the way that black history is told sometimes is quite scientific. It's like H happened, two happened, O happened, now we have water. But actually H was really bad, two was really painful and O never should have happened. Um we never should have had water. I don't know I didn't know where I was going with that. But um, I think if we if we are talking about sla slavery happened, do you know what I mean? We can't just remove it from the curriculum. It's a massive part of British his British history as well. But I think if we start to teach it with that in, in a way that encourages critical thinking towards it, we could acknowledge that it happened away from linking it to the celebration of Britain because it was a very dark part of history. Um, and that's what I would say. And also, like Denzel said, broaden the spectrum because the Britain that we live in today the black contribution to that is massive. If we're thinking about secu the security systems we have in place in the UK now, they came from black minds. If we're talking about why we did so well in certain battles in war, black people on the front line. If we're talking about how half of Liverpool was built, black people on the front line. So I think just incorporating how much of Britain has been built on the back of people that came in as workers, right? So, yeah, I think just in, in having a counterweight to the negative is what I'd say. Mm -hmm. Um, and on that same note, just over here. Um, firstly, I wanted to say um, well done to both of you for working on this during a lockdown when everybody was really just stressed out and not really knowing what was happening in the world and you had to focus on something like this. Um, and specifically to Denzel, also working on your dissertation at the same time. I know when I was working on mine, I couldn't focus on anything else, <laughs> so well done for that. Um, and I wanted to ask, um, do you have any other illustration um, projects going on currently? Um, not at the moment. It would be cool, though, because like, I would like to draw more superiors, things like that, you know, tell more stories, maybe some of my own, because that's what got me into illustration. But, yeah, yeah. Not not many at the moment. Yeah. Um, and again on this way. Hi, I was just really curious to know for both of you, really, like, how did you come up with the superpowers from ordinary people? Did it relate to them in their careers, or was it something about the personality? Um, it was quite a journey because I think when I dived into the book, I was like, yeah, wicked. I'm gonna write about superheroes. And then I'm I'm looking at the list. So you had like Luau Deng, basketball player, or Dean Asher Smith, fastest woman in Britain, or Liam Bakes, uh, master sh chef, uh, baker. Sorry. And then I thought, oh, they, these these actually have to be magical powers. You can't just say he's a great chef because no one no one wants to read that in a kids' book about superheroes. <laughs> so I think um, it was definitely staying in this space of mystic, staying in this place of magic. Um, so, for example, there's two brothers in the book, Sean and Craig Mackinoff, who have a cookbook, like a Car Caribbean recipe cookbook, where they just kind of reimagine Caribbean food. So plantain cake or plantain... Just really nice. Oh, I'm hungry. <laughs> like they they reimagine what would otherwise be really traditional in really interesting ways in food. And they kind of did the superpower themselves. Um, so all, my main thing, which really helped, was thinking of an origin story. So oftentimes in interviews, these people would say, um, I first started eating Caribbean food at my grandma's house. And she would tell me stories about how when she first came to London, um, food gatherings were the only time that she saw people that looked like her or were also from the islands that she came from. Um, so I thought, cool, grandma's cooking, let's make that a superpower. So from there, it becomes the smell. Um, so when they start smelling scotch bonnets frying or brown stew chicken stewing or curry goat boiling, um, whilst for everyone else it makes people hungry, for them, the smell travels through their noses and it kind of frazzles their brain. And in the reshaking of their brain, they start to reimagine what these foods could become. 
what happens if we put scotch bonnet in mac and cheese what happens if we turn curry goat into in what happens if we put curry goat into a patty and that's what their brain is doing and then it all has to come out it needs to spill out of them and it comes out through their hands and that's what they make to that's one of their superpowers their nose and their hands basically um so it's definitely things like that or for example um who else is um afrocentrics um the ones that Denzel spoke about, they make hair products for natural for Af- Afro natural hair, and their superpower. What did their superpower come from again? Um, I think it was mainly the the hair or something to do with uh, like just the the hair of many black women or something like that. So the Earth's elixir. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. So. They're on this whole their their brand Afrocentric is about like using as many natural products as possible, put it back putting it back into um, black hair. So that superpower, I think, feel like that kind of presented itself to me as a superpower because the same way the Earth nourishes um, everything on the planet, um, it can also nourish us. So they become essentially these not pirates, but in the book they're these people that go out and scan the earth and they pick up the earth's elixir and they can look at leaves and work out which leaf is going to be really good for this hair type and they make these potions when they go back home and then these potions are the things that revitalize the earth's garden but on black woman's hair um so i think yeah i think some just kind of presented themselves in a in a in quite a natural way like if you're Dina Asher Smith, the super speed, you're the fastest woman in Britain, you know. Um, some were a bit more kind of, oh, how do I turn this into a superpower? Like um, uh, the weather forecast, mm. weather forecasters. But then I thought, actually, you're communicating with the sky. So they now have an intimate relationship that only they have with the weather. And the weather's desperately trying to tell us something when there's a storm coming. But only they have the power to listen and tune in. And that's why they're weather forecasters. Um, yeah. Um, might have time for one more quick one if anyone has another question otherwise I'll ask my own okay okay. Um, I just want to know what's next for both of you like what you're working on next uh, what you want to work on next whether there'd be a follow up book to this one uh, for me like now I've finished uni I just want to you know dive in head first into doing more books and maybe doing like concept art for animations and things like that so I think that would be cool, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I mean, I hope there's another one. I think that's that's the question that people keep asking. Like, is it going to be turned into a film mm-hmm. or a series? And is there going to be another one? Because there's obviously so many people to write about. And also, if they're going to do some for other races as well, mm-hmm. like Chinese superheroes mm-hmm. or Asian superheroes. Um, so hopefully, I haven't got the answers to any of those. So hopefully, that is something that the Murky team's working on. But um, for me, I've got another poetry collection coming out in October. Um I don't think I've actually announced that anywhere. I don't even think I'm allowed to announce that. Anyway, it's done now. <laughs> but there's yeah, there's there's work coming out in October. Um and until then I just want to write as much as possible, develop more um film and documentary concepts as well mm-hmm. and kind of work into that script writing monologue type space. Great. Um so we are finishing bang on time i'd love to thank both of you for joining us um i'd also love to thank samsung for supporting this panel um so if we could all just give a huge thank you to both of the lovely contributors to this book and it went on sale last week so if you don't have it already then i would get hold of it straight away and share it with any young people in your lives and for yourselves as well it's a great book so thanks everyone thank you